Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar, The State of Mobile Development. My name is Kate and I'm a member of the marketing team here at Pluralsight and I'll be your host for this session. We're joined today by Sam Basu. Uh, Sam is a true advocate of developers. He's an expert, speaker, writer and blogger. And over the next hour or so, Sam will be sharing his insights and his recommendations on how to choose on the process of how to choose a platform for your next mobile application. Uh, but before I hand over to Sam, just want to run through a few housekeeping things. Um, this session is being recorded and we will email you a link to the recording in the next day or two. So do watch out for that. If you encounter any technical issues, and it does happen with Zoom, uh, say the screen freezes or the audio drops, I'd recommend you leave the webinar and rejoin. That usually fixes it. Um, and finally, this is your opportunity to ask Sam any questions you may have at all. And how you do that is simply type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen as you th think of them. Um, and Sam will get to them at the end of his presentation. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to you, Sam. All right, yeah, uh, thank you. Hopefully you can hear me and see me. Um, thanks for having me on, uh, Kate and uh, uh, Dom here at Pluralsight. Um, so uh, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, welcome all of you. I don't know if I can live up to uh, how I was introduced uh, as an expert. I, I am just trying to learn just like everybody else. And uh, I guess you could say I'm, I'm old, so I've, I've seen things and uh, you just uh, gain some experience uh, as you uh, do uh, mobile dev uh, over the years. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm uh, glad to be uh, uh, able to uh, talk to all of you for the next hour. And um, yeah, have a little fun. And I see uh, a lot of you uh, starting to come in. So yeah, welcome. And we appreciate all of you. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to switch back from my slides. Yeah, let's stay there. There you go. So I appreciate all of you um, uh, kind of uh, taking an hour out of your work away from your families to come and join us here. So uh, thank you and uh, welcome. So uh, let us uh, begin. Uh, this is uh, State of Mobile Dev, like I said, and uh, my name is Sam Basu. Uh, I am a developer advocate uh, for Progress Software, and you may know us for some of the things we make. Uh, it's uh, Tideric uh, for uh, all of the .NET developers in the house, uh, Kendo UI for all of the JavaScript developers, Fiddler and reporting and testing, all the different things we can do to make developers more successful. Uh, I, I come from a heavy .NET background, uh, but I know just enough JavaScript uh, to be dangerous. <laughs> uh, so that right there is my uh, social handle. So if you need to get hold of me after the webinar, uh, I, I love to chat. Uh, so please uh, do so on Twitter, on uh, Skype, on GitHub, like that, that's me everywhere uh, on the internet. And like Kate said, like this is being recorded. So if you have something come up or kids are shouting, whatever, uh, don't worry, we will uh, get you the recordings. And over the next hour, I mean, hour is not a whole lot of time. So I'm gonna bounce through a lot of different technologies, not to uh, hopefully confuse you, but just to kind of show you a flavor of all that's possible right now and where things are headed in future. Um, hopefully that's just meant to kind of spike your interest in, um, in, in a certain tech. Uh, I'm gonna to try to show you some demos. So I'll start off kind of setting the uh, playing field uh, for the next like uh, 20, 25 minutes or so. And then I'll love to jump into some demos and actually show you some things in action, okay? So like I said, get hold of me if you need to, otherwise let us begin. And um, before we start again, we are all living through uh, a global pandemic. It's a particularly difficult year for everybody. So I hope uh, you are being safe and uh, you're taking care of yourself and your families. Uh, let's all be kind uh, and, uh, and have empathy for uh, ourselves and our families and people that we work with. So uh, better days are, are ahead for all of us. And since we are all kind of remote, I, I love bringing out a map to uh, see where we are virtually online. Uh, I am in um, sort of the East Coast, uh, Northwest Pennsylvania uh, here in the US, uh, up by the five uh, Great Lakes that we have. I'm right up by a lake called Erie and it's a town called Erie, Pennsylvania. I know the uh, plural set folks who are your hosts uh, today, they are in UK. 
uh, and I heard that there were a lot of folks from Germany uh, and, and France, so bonjour, I, I love you all, and I'm sure there are other folks from Europe, so uh, glad to have you join us uh, this afternoon, and I'm sure there are others uh, from around the world, so yeah, feel free to use the chat as well, um, just to kind of drop in where you are, what your time zone is, it's, it's always uh, good to know. Uh, let me check really quick, uh, I think there is a chat message, and I'm going to try to uh, yeah, okay. I'm going to try to read the chat and the Q&A uh, as I get time uh, throughout the session, but uh, I, I got a lot of things to cover, so uh, uh, bear with me. I will try to get to all of your questions uh, towards the end. All right, let's dive in. So it's 2020, <coughs> excuse me, and you, you decide that uh, you want to build for mobile form factors. It doesn't need to be an app all the time, but you want to build for mobile because unless you target the mobile form factor, you're missing out on a big chunk uh, of the audience, right? So how do you do that? Turns out this is not very easy. We have been doing mobile for the last like 15 years now, but um, not, not so easy yet. Uh, it, it's like me showing up uh, to your house uh, and saying, here's all the ingredients, go make yourself a cake uh, for your birthday. That's not very nice, right? And plus there are just too many ingredients, I mean, too many recipes, too many ingredients on how you make the cake. So we need some guidance. We need to know if we are doing the right thing. And um, as, as developers, like we like to have choice until we have too much choice and then we are a little crippled. Uh, we are always questioning ourselves as to are we doing the right thing? So I see uh, a lot of you chiming in on chat. Uh, yeah, greetings from Sweden, Poland, Italy. Look at that, Netherlands, uh, Northern Ireland. So hello, hello, hello all. So glad to have you all. Okay, so this is gonna be my one minute spiel on all things mobile as we stand today. And these are my five broad ways to build for mobile form factors. I'm sure there are other like edge cases that I'm not including here, but these are the broad ones that I see. So if you want to go native like iOS, Android and Windows, uh, by all means, you can go native. Uh, each of these companies will give you uh, SDKs and wonderful tools and API access to go build native apps. And you're close to the metal. It's a beautiful user experience, but it is just expensive, right? As we all know, uh, if you're writing games or if you don't care about other platforms, if, if you have the luxury of just going iOS and just going Android, by all means, native is still a great uh, route. But the moment we try targeting multiple um, platforms, then it gets expensive because as an individual developer, I have to learn multiple things. It's even more expensive for enterprises because now they have to maintain like three different teams and three different code bases towards maintaining a single app. So ideally, we would like to write cross-platform things if possible. So when you talk about cross-platform strategies, you essentially say, do I want to do web stuff or do I want to do .NET or pre-compiled stuff? If you want to do web stuff, there are a lot of options. Um, if you have a website today, there is no reason why your website cannot be a good citizen on a mobile form factor. There, there's a lot of tools for mobile web. All of the SPA applications like Angular or SPA frameworks like Angular, Bootstrap, uh, Vue, React, they will all let you do uh, front-end SPA and they can be nicely wrapped up in touch-friendly uh, controls. And then you can kind of take um, this concept of mobile web to an extreme of a progressive web application. This is where your your mobile website is a very good citizen on, uh, on a, a mobile form factor. The user gets to pin your app to the home screen. You get to send out push notifications. You have service workers running in the background so you can update parts of your app and it's a great experience, but it is not native. You are using the web as a distribution medium. So what about if you wanted to go to the stores like the app stores? So we did uh, what was called the hybrid approach um, from like 2010 onwards. Uh, you may remember PhoneGap, um, and that was the first time we learned how to do HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, bundle it all up, put it in the store, and we had uh, plugins that give us access to the device sensors, and it was good uh, for a while. And it still is a good strategy if you're doing like line of business applications. PhoneGap has now evolved into Cordova that uh, Apache actually owns but it is not native, right? It, it, you're literally running inside of a big web browser window uh, and a shell. 
So performance is not the best. Uh, maybe it, you don't care about down to a sec millisecond performance, but it's not the best. So in the last few years, we have seen this concept of JavaScript native apps really gain a lot of prominence because you are using JavaScript or TypeScript or any of the SPA frameworks. Uh, like we make things like uh, native script, uh, it's, it's an open source framework. Everything is a pretty much open source here. Uh, works with Angular, works with React, works with Vue. If you're doing React for your web applications, you can do React native. So all of these things do the exact same thing. They let you render native UI uh, and have native performance, uh, have access to all of the APIs, but from JavaScript, right? And then we have the cross compile story, which is higher level languages that get compiled down, uh, not just interpreted, compiled down. And this is where Xamarin, uh, we'll, we'll spend some time with uh, Xamarin and .NET, uh, and then we'll go into JavaScript. But Xamarin has been the prominent uh, player, uh, lets you write .NET to uh, go to iOS, Android, and other platforms. There are things like Uno platform, uh, which is a separate flavor of XAML, also lets you do the same thing. Flutter is there if you want to, if, or if you're okay writing Dart, then you can go, um, um, go cross platform as well. So what it comes down to is uh, this definition, and we will talk about this uh, over and over again. What is it that makes a native app, right? What is it that we are after? So to me, it's like three things. Does your app have native UI? Like, are you using UI that's customizable for iOS or Android? Do you have native performance? And do you have native API access? Now, all three of them perhaps don't need to be checked to be called a native app. For example, like Flutter, uh, and, and uh, people can argue over this. Uh, I don't think it's completely native because it, it is uh, painting a lot of pixels with like Skia Sharp and other libraries. But perhaps it doesn't matter because the performance is so good and, and the dev loop uh, as we develop our apps, that's so fast. So you, you, you don't care sometimes. But that's the mobile landscape. Uh, please feel free to chime in like if you have any questions or if you know of other uh, side things that I'm not mentioning. But these are the five bigger ones for me. OK, let's, uh, let's move on. I'm, I keep losing my cursor. There you go. So let's start with .NET, and then we'll talk about JavaScript. So the .NET stack has been evolving very fast, as we know. This is .NET as we stand today. Uh, this purple box here, this is the .NET framework that we have been used to for the last like 17 years, and it's going to be fine. It's not going, uh, going away anywhere. It's just kind of in a maintenance mode uh, beyond this year. .NET Core uh, is about five years old. It's lean. It's modular. It's not like the giant .NET monolithic framework on which everything runs. This is more customizable. Uh, you choose the modules that you need for your app, and it, for the first time, runs outside of Windows. So you can run it on Mac or Linux. And then we had Mono, which is a port of .NET, which is about 15 years old. So the desire to get .NET out of Windows is nothing new. And Mono is a very, very mature uh, open source uh, platform. And it has a huge API canvas area. And uh, this is what Xamarin runs on. And Xamarin was an acquisition. So Xamarin, this box was missing prior to 2016 when Xamarin was acquired by Microsoft. And it's an important box because that lets you, uh, that lets Microsoft tell you the story that with .NET, you can go anywhere. And it's, it's true, you can go to iOS, Android, uh, Tizen, the web, WPF, you name it, uh, lots of different apps and or, or frameworks. And then the tools are for trade uh, here on the right. Those have come a long way again, right? It's not just Visual Studio on Windows. I use VS for Mac all the time. I mean, crashes a couple of times a week, but that's understandable. Visual Studio Code is beautiful. It's cross-platform uh, lightweight. So again, things are evolving fast, but this is where we stand today. This is where we are headed. Um, actually, in like two weeks time, uh, two or three weeks time, there is a .NET conf, it's a virtual conf coming up uh, in early or the November 10th-ish onwards. And this is where you're gonna see Microsoft announce .NET 5 to be production ready. It, it, I mean, you have been seeing some release candidates, some uh, preview bits, but this is a unification effort. There has been a little bit of fragmentation. So they're taking the best of .NET Core, best of Mono, putting it all together. So the developers don't get to choose the app runtimes. It's just dependent on the type of app you're building. So again, the tools get better, uh, nothing to complain here. So let's talk about Xamarin real quick. So Xamarin, like I said, has been making it very easy for .NET developers to build truly native cross-platform native apps uh, across platforms. This is where Xamarin had started like years back. I remember these times. Uh, it used to be called Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android and still called those things. And this is kind of what is evolving into .NET for iOS and .NET for Android going forward. This is where we first learned that we can write C Sharp. Uh, for our cross-platform apps. So you have some business logic that is here, and then you're writing these heads, iOS, Android, and Windows separately, and this is native. 
right? So you can still do that. But as a .NET developer, I had to learn a lot of about uh, like iOS, which I did not care for. So I'm a much bigger fan of Xamarin Forms, which is probably about four and a half uh, years old now, maybe a little more. Uh, and, and this was a great strategy because it lets us write a shared UI layer, uh, which is an abstraction. And, and, and to be honest, like this is a particularly difficult thing to solve, right? Now, iOS, Android, and Windows, and by Windows, I do not mean Windows Phone. That's been dead many times over. I spent like a couple of years in Windows Phone. All other Windows devices is what I mean. These are very different platforms. And you are looking for an abstraction that can be written in XAML, which is an extensible application markup language, kind of like XML. If you have done any like WPF or UWP or Silverlight, this is another flavor of XAML. Or you can define the whole thing in C Sharp and essentially at runtime, Xamarin Form turns around and renders native UI uh, for each of those controls, uh, native for iOS and Android. Now keep in mind, like the reality of this is like, there is a little bit of that purple and green and blue uh, and, and you want that reality because at any time you can dive into native land and you can, I mean, you can get a long way without knowing much about iOS or Android, but then when you're actually shipping apps professionally, you realize that you do need to know a little bit about the native uh, platforms. So you can render native things if you need to. So this is a great approach, uh, lets you uh, kind of share code across multiple platforms. I almost always start here. And then if I need to go to native, uh, I have the choice. Now our phones are loaded with sensors, right? There are cameras and geolocations and everything. How do you get access to that? So we used to do multiple things. We used to write Java, we used to write Swift or Objective-C um, and uh, we used to have components, Xamarin components that let us have access to some of the APIs. Um, that's still there, but this is the preferred way going forward because it's like one NuGet package from Microsoft. This is all in C Sharp. So you don't care as to how exactly it's rendered or uh, how the APIs are working on iOS or Android, you just write C-sharp and it just works. Now they are being careful. Like if you bring this in and then you just use the camera, uh, they don't bloat up your app package. They're careful to do some tree shaking and only give you the bits that your app needs. So uh, this is great going forward. Now a design pattern uh, that we often commonly use for anytime we have a XAML and C-sharp code base is called MVVM. It's model view V model. This is something we have been using for a long, long time. If uh, there are .NET devs in the house like me, uh, we are used to this like from WPF days uh, or UWP or Silverlight days. Um, and there are lots of frameworks that help you out. That's MVVM Cross, Prism and MVVM Lite. You don't have to do it, but it kind of helps to keep your sanity on a large code base. And uh, this is what we do for Xamarin Forms today. But as I'll show you, this is kind of evolving to open up a few more things tomorrow. Uh, with Xamarin Forms though, or Xamarin in, in, in particular, uh, iOS or Android, it is purely native. Uh, in the Android, you don't have to JIT anymore. It's truly ahead of time compilation, true .app or .apk packages. Everything is native. So the, the framework doesn't get in the way of performance, but I mean, we are developers. We can always do uh, stupid things to, uh, to kind of hinder our performance. And one of the downsides with uh, Xamarin was it was a little expensive. Uh, it was $1,000 per developer per platform. And uh, Microsoft took over and said, no, let's just share the love. It is completely open source now. There is no barrier to entry. Visual Studio, if you're using that, uh, Community Edition onwards, all of the tools are free. So the barrier to entry is gone. I mean, really, this is free and open source. Uh, and you're coming into a rich ecosystem. I do like daily builds sometimes uh, from Xamarin Forms. So it's, it's a good place to be. Now, since it is open source, the community has stepped up and there are some very smart people. Uh, and essentially the part that takes your shared UI code and renders native UI is called, uh, a piece of code is called a renderer. And those renderers can be rewritten for other platforms. So now we have renderers for Mac OS, for GTK Linux, for WPF. Uh, I don't know if folks uh, know about Tizen. If you have a Samsung device that is not running Android, it's likely running Tizen. So your, your fridge, and your, uh, your television are, are running Tizen and Xamarin Forms is very welcome. So Xamarin Forms does go to quite a few places now. Now let's talk about a few edge cases that are on the side. Uh, so this is talking about Mac uh, and the Apple ecosystem. Uh, they have a similar problem. They have uh, folks wanting to write all about iOS, but not many folks want to write for the Mac desktop store. So they are trying to get iOS apps to run on a Mac uh, as a desktop. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, some of it is already there. Um, I think a dozen or so apps already work, but this is still a work in progress. They are, they are gonna keep flushing uh, uh, more of this in the next year. 
And each of these iOS apps, essentially you have a bigger surface area and you can render things better. Um, but each of these iOS apps can be written with Xamarin Forms. So it gives your app just a bigger uh, market and a whole uh, new set of users to uh, look into. Um, you also see the advent of what's called dual screen devices. You had a Surface uh, Duo come out, which is running Android. You're going to see Surface Neo come out, which is running a version of Windows 10, uh, 10X. Uh, what this invites is just a new whole UX paradigm because you have extra surface area. How do you use it? Uh, is it like a companion uh, pane that you use? Is it like a master detail? So lots of things to kind of consider if you want to target those form factors. And again, you can do them all uh, with Xamarin Forms. Now, this is kind of... <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry for my uh, throat today. Um, but this is kind of the evolution of um, Xamarin Forms uh, into the next year into uh, what's called MAUI, which is multi-platform app UI. It's a catchy word. Uh, so essentially this is the evolution. This is where they're going to bring in Xamarin, iOS or Android into the .NET fold. So they become .NET for iOS and .NET for Android. And Xamarin Forms evolves into what's called MAUI. You still will have support for all of the things that Xamarin Forms does support, but they're improving on the things that are painful. Um, they're improving on a, a single project structure, which I'll show you, um, just the support for Windows, support for Mac, and those things get better. But this is not there yet. I mean, this is open source. Uh, things are being worked on right now. This is stated for actually next year, next November. Uh, so .NET 6 is, is when this is going to come out, but you can see the previews. And if you look at like where things are headed, like you will have support for Windows and Mac uh, for desktop, iOS and Android, all of your smartphones or smart TVs or watch OS, you, you got all of that. Um, but they're improving on the things that are painful uh, for Xamarin developers in terms of the project structures and, and how we do the builds and how we render code. Now, one other thing that they're improving on is like sometimes we don't realize that it's, it's a bit of a walled garden that we have for Xamarin developers. Like once you come in, tools are great, but uh, it maybe takes a little bit of a learning curve and we're not inviting everybody else uh, to the party. So. Um, we talked about MVVM for, uh, for Xamarin Forms. This is a design pattern called MVU, which is what a lot of like web developers are used to. If you do anything with Flutter or React Native, you're kind of doing this uh, anyways. So this is a pattern that's going to be welcome in .NET MAUI. So with .NET MAUI, you're going to have uh, three ways essentially, or that's the promise for now, of rendering your UI. You will have XAML and C Sharp uh, with MVVM. You're going to have Blazor and you're going to have MVU. So this is the MVU design pattern. It's a little more simpler. Um, the model here is not just your data or your services. This is the state of your application. So kind of like what React does and the model drives what the UI is showing. And then anything the, the user changes in the UI, you have an update loop that triggers the model to update and that in turn drives the UI again. So it's a one way data binding, but it kind of works in a loop. And there are experimental frameworks right now that will show you exactly what this MVU pattern is gonna look like uh, with, uh, with .NET MAUI. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, uh, when it, when you come to um, like targeting uh, Windows devices in particular, then you may have heard a lot about uh, UWP, which is Universal Windows Platform. This is still a legit solution, uh, especially if you care about the Windows XAML. The Xamarin Forms XAML is kind of catered towards mobile form factors. This is Windows XAML. It still lets you target a lot of devices, but universal within the uh, within the Windows uh, universe. So you can do Xbox, you can do HoloLens and Surface Hub. Uh, and you're catering to all Windows devices. They are realizing, however, that they cannot be too tied to Windows as an OS. They want to ship uh, their updates faster. So you see them uh, separating out the UI stack into what's called WinUI. And uh, this is coming as well in November or early next year. Uh, so that's the new modern uh, UI stack, end-to-end -end stack for all things Windows. And uh, Xamarin Forms actually uses uh, some of this, lets you target UWP. And with .NET and MAUI, you will be able to use WinUI to target uh, Windows. So again, uh, lots of cross-platform solutions, lots of ways to share code. Now, this is actually something uh, close to me up in, uh, up in Canada. There are some very smart folks uh, over at Montreal and they took UWP XAML and they made it work on, they made the bridge over to iOS or Android and as well as uh, WebAssembly. Um, which we'll talk about. So you'll notice that they are running on mono, they are running on Xamarin, nothing out of the blue, but the rendering is using UWP XAML instead of Xamarin from XAML. So if you care about that uh, Windows XAML, then this is, uh, this is your thing to go. 
Now, this is about web, but I will mention, uh, I'm old. I, I did Silverlight back in my days and the dev experience was great. Could you do XAML back for the web? And yes, we are kind of getting to it. And this has implications for other mobile stacks as well, because now we are seeing WebAssembly, which is a low level, almost assembly-like uh, format that your higher level languages like C Sharp and C++ and Rust can be compiled down into. And then your modern evergreen browsers will just execute that just like they execute JavaScript. So it's it's fast and it's native. And this opens up the playing field in terms of where we can share code between mobile and, and, and web. Okay. Uh, this is where you also see Blazor. Uh, Blazor is uh, a great framework, particularly if you come from a .NET background and in, in the ASP.NET land, this is where Blazor is really shining and people are excited for good reason because it lets you write C-sharp front and back. So a lot of .NET shops have kind of been doing SPA frameworks in the front end and they have let .NET be the back end as Web API and it's very fast, but Blazor says, no, let's use WebAssembly and let's run it front and back. So when Blazor first came out, they used to do a lot of what's called server-side Blazor, where it is a server-side model, but then you are shipping things to the client side and you're maintaining the DOM, the document object model, the HTML visual tree over a SignalR real-time bridge. And it, it's very fast and it's good, but starting like this May, they actually have what's called fully client-side Blazor, which is using WebAssembly and your C-sharp DLLs are being shipped over to the browser and everything is good and it's running very fast using WebAssembly. So Blazor actually has, I mean, it is for the web, but it has implications for uh, other things as well. Like you could include a Blazor application within uh, a desktop shell using something like Electron, maybe maybe it's a little uh, heavy handed, but you can do that. Uh, like a lot, lot of your uh, apps like Visual Studio Code or Team or Slack. I mean, those are essentially web apps and you can do that with Blazor. And then uh, Blazor lets you write PWAs very nicely, which I'll show you. And Blazor lets you write native apps as well with Xamarin Forms. It's still experimental, but uh, I'll, I'll show you. So Blazor has implications for desktop and mobile as well. Okay, so I talked about 20 minutes on uh, on .NET, so let's uh, let's maybe fast up a little bit. And I know some of you are maybe not native English speakers, so forgive me for going a little bit uh, quick. I'm I'm trying to cover as much as I can, and uh, all of the slide decks and all of my demos, uh, you can have them all. So don't worry about those things. We'll email you out so you have access to all of that. So let's talk about JavaScript, right? Because uh, a lot of you uh, write uh, JavaScript every day. So progressive web apps, this is a great solution. If you want to have a good citizen on a mobile form factor, which is essentially a website. Uh, so you want things to be reliable. You want things to be working offline. You want things to render fast initially and then be an engaging experience, uh, having uh, things that are touch friendly. And there are lots of apps that are lots of solutions that kind of help you out towards building a progressive web apps. Um, there are There is Lighthouse uh, from Google. Um, we'll talk about the PWA Builder, which is actually a wonderful tool that literally takes any website and says, let's build you a, a kind of a metadata file uh, so that you can declare to the browser that I am a little bit more than just a website. I can have some storage. I can have some service workers running in the background. And um, uh, I mean, the tools of your trade, the frameworks that you can use to build PWAs is, is a lot. Right, all of the SPA frameworks, JavaScript frameworks, React, Angular, Vue. You can use Blazor. You can use Twitter Bootstrap. So again, a lot of choices, uh, and, and this is a good thing. This is a kind of a, a, a look at the PWA Builder, which essentially takes a website and gives you all of the ammunition to go make it a, a PWA. Now we mentioned Cordova um, initially, and this is uh, still a solution, but. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think uh, Apache uh, a month or so back, uh, they, they essentially said they're going to stop um, development on it and kind of put it on maintenance mode. Because again, kind of uh, the, the mobile landscape is different from where it was like uh, seven, eight years back. Like we have learned a lot of things. We know how to render things fast and we don't need to all do it inside of a web shell. So again, if you are building a simple line of business app, forms over data, this is a good solution. But um, and you had some help there. This is Ionic framework, which lets you build PWAs, but this kind of started with the whole hybrid solution as well. So if you are building hybrid apps, I mean, look into some of these frameworks, but really if you're building hybrid apps, you're already doing JavaScript. So why not build a, a native app as well? So this is where we talk about some of the JavaScript native uh, frameworks, uh, things like NativeScript. Uh, all of these are open source. Uh, so I'm, I'm fond of some of these ones here. So uh, NativeScript is an open source framework that lets you do JavaScript or TypeScript um, or works with Angular, 
works with Vue, uh, works with Svelte, works with React as well. So the goal is that you're going to uh, share as much of uh, the code as possible between your web apps and your mobile apps, right? So the routing, uh, all of your business logic, uh, all of it is shared. Just the UI stack is a little different because now you're rendering for mobile as compared to doing it for the web. And I mean, all of these frameworks actually do, are, I mean, they're very similar to like what even like Xamarin Forms does. Xamarin Forms takes your C Sharp and XAML, renders native UI. These ones take your HTML and JavaScript and render native UI. So same idea, just done with a different tech. React Native, we talked about this. If you are already building React for your web applications, it is a natural fit for you to do uh, React Native, um, to go native uh, on iOS or Android. And again, the tools are great. The, uh, the web community is actually particularly good in terms of the tooling. And uh, let me see if I can uh, find time to mention this, but we, we care a lot about this thing called the dev loop. Like when we are writing a mobile app, you want to write some code and you want to see that code right away in the in the app simulator or on your device. So the if you're doing web stuff, then it's kind of easy because you have things like Webpack, which can um, which can bundle and it knows exactly which component of the app you're touching and just only update that. Xamarin has been a, uh, I mean, this has been a pain point for Xamarin. <clears throat> so essentially, uh, excuse me. So with Xamarin, they have actually uh, invested quite a bit uh, to come up with things like hot reload. So now you can write SAML and then uh, still, when you look at the simulator, you just like save a file and it updates itself. So that's the thing that mobile devs are always looking for, just a quick uh, dev loop. So all of that is in place. And if you were to kind of look into React Native and get kind of inspired, you can look into uh, all of what Microsoft is doing. Almost uh, the whole gamut of Office applications are written in React Native. So um, that, that's a validation right there that React Native is, uh, is a legit strategy. Uh, and then if you are okay, uh, learning a little bit of Dart. So I don't know anything about Dart. So this is a learning curve for me, but again, it's object oriented language. Uh, how difficult can it be? Um, language is the fluffy thing on the, on the top. So if you are uh, open to this, then uh, Flutter is great, not just for mobile, but also for desktop applications. Um, again, they, they use a lot of pixel painting and uh, they make it a really fast dev loop as well for devs. So let's uh, talk about uh, some other other options here. And I see a quick question here. Uh, I'm going to take a minute. Casey Ferguson, do these PWAs have any native compilers to allow installation devices? Yes, yes. And I will show you that. For instance, allowing access to network connections like native script allows. Yes. So uh, Casey, that's a, that's a great question. So there are some limitations, OK? PWAs uh, were things that like Google first started pushing it. Microsoft is completely behind it. Apple is kind of grudgingly <laughs> supporting it in, in Safari. So uh, for the most part, you will be able to install an app. And I, I can show you that app real quick, uh, a sample app. But uh, in terms of device APIs, um, you are still a little limited on, on some fronts. You're not going to get everything from the web standpoint as you get from a native uh, app, right? So there are some differences, but again, it depends on what exactly you have on the app that you're trying to build. Give me a second. Okay, so let's talk about um, the reality for mobile devs. I'm going to spend my probably uh, five to 10 minutes more, uh, and then I'm going to try to show you some demos. So this is our reality as we develop um, uh, mobile websites or apps. How do you deploy those apps as you start writing them? You obviously have the simulators and emulators to start off with on, um, on a Mac. Uh, things are easy if you're targeting iOS, you already have Xcode, you have all of those things. And this is a question we get a lot, like particularly coming from uh, Xamarin land, do you need an Apple device to build for iOS? The answer is yes and no. Um, Apple needs you to be able to build the app package from Xcode that is licensed to the same developer who has the Apple Store account, I and mean, no one can get you around that. So you do need a Mac, but it doesn't need to be a physical Mac. A lot of people buy a Mac Mini, throw it on the network just to get the build, or you can go to the cloud. Uh, there are some cloud solutions like Mac in the cloud, and I think there's one more service that I'll talk about. So you can do a, the build in the cloud. But otherwise, the simulators are great uh, for iPhone, I, uh, iPads, you name it. Um, if you are doing uh, iOS development on Windows, then you have the Windows iOS simulator, which essentially just simulates what the iOS simulator is doing. But Windows devices do have touch. So if you're on a Surface or other Windows device, you can pinch and zoom and use the app like your users would. So that, that's nice. Um, Android, again, things have come a long way. Uh, I'm sure you folks remember how the Android uh, simulators used to be, took ages to come out. 
um, and, and run. And things now are better because they support like Hyper-V. And then there are things like Jenny Motion. So use the Android simulator that works for you uh, best. But I mean, it's, it's just Android. I mean, you, you know what you're getting into. It's not, it's not easy. And some of these um, uh, kind of simulators come as virtual hard drives. So they will chew through uh, a little bit of your, uh, uh, your, your laptop or your computer's hard disk space. Uh, yeah, and like I mentioned, like uh, you can run Docker and you can do uh, like uh, HoloLens or other VR development while you're running uh, Android simulator. So that, that's nice. Uh, so this is actually the one that I was talking about. Uh, I, I didn't remember if I had a slide for it. So take a look at this. So this is essentially XAML forms. So what you have here is XAML here on the left, and then you have an app working here on the right. And this used to be a pain. Um, with XAML forms, but they have fixed it. Now you can edit some of the XAML and on the fly, you see the app changing, right? And this is exactly what we want. This is what we want for what we have had for web stuff. And now you can do it for, uh, for XAML as well. And like I said, like whether you're doing native script or whether you're doing um, or React Native or whether you're doing Flutter, all of them have this exact same uh, tooling. It's called Live Sync or Live Preview or whatever you want to call it. It's the same idea that uh, they can look at a component that you're changing and only update that in your simulator or on your device. So that, that's nice for the dev loop for developers. Uh, let's talk about some of the other things like uh, mobile apps do not live in a silo. We are all jumping between devices throughout the day. So how do you support all of that? Uh, well, the cloud does help. Um, you don't have to use a, a public cloud, but if you care to, then there's a lot of options. Uh, you can run it off a SQL server under your desk. Uh, doesn't matter, but as long as you have data and as long as you can share that data out as a service so you can uh, hit cross-platform solutions. So if you want to go to Azure, you know uh, Azure, it's a huge infrastructure, does everything under the sun. But what you're looking for really is the mobile backend sometimes that lets you do things that you don't want to do by hand, especially if you're targeting like uh, folks in other continents, you want the CDN support so you can deliver your content closer to where they are. You want authentication. Uh, you want uh, things like push notifications. So all of those things are like built into most of the cloud backends. And this is, uh, again, I don't work for Microsoft, but I mean, these are things I'm fond of. Uh, Azure Cognitive Services lets you do some AI or ML in your, uh, in your apps. So this way uh, you can provide that little bit of intelligence and a little bit of engagement uh, inside of your app uh, uh, for, our, for a mobile perspective. If you wanted to go to uh, Amazon, AWS, uh, they have a mobile hub, the similar idea. And give me one second here. Uh, I see some questions pop up and I will get to them in just, just a minute. So uh, same idea, you, you have a mobile backend that does all of those things um, uh, in terms of developing uh, apps and, and doing CI CD builds and giving it the push notification that you need. So let's, uh, let's move on to uh, a few other cloud backends. Uh, there's a thing called Kinvey, which again does the same idea, runs on Azure, runs on uh, AWS if you need to, and it works across all uh, cross-platform solutions. Now, what we are kind of getting into with, with these cloud backends is this idea of DevOps. And, and mobile DevOps is a little tricky because with mobile apps, it seldom is fire and forget. It's a continuous work uh, that you do throughout the life cycle of your app. You have to know how your app is doing, uh, how it's working. Uh, are you wanting to distribute just to your enterprise and not go to the stores? Uh, are you getting crash reports and, and all of that? So there are uh, some tools that help you out. Um, this one is one of my favorite ones, Visual Studio App Center. This lets you uh, kind of do all the things. And it's not just for Xamarin or just for uh, native apps. It is for everything under the sun. This lets you do a CI CD pipeline. And I mentioned like Mac, uh, doing Mac uh, iOS builds in the cloud. You can do that uh, very nicely with VS App Center. And again, uh, for a team collaboration standpoint, these type of uh, apps are really good. Um, so take a look at this. There's also GitHub Actions now. Uh, so it kind of really lets you automate the flow of how you push code and you do a build and how you uh, distribute that build uh, to your audiences. Um, kind of more uh, screenshot. These are really old ones that I used to use. Uh, this is Test Cloud. So uh, this was a Xamarin offering, and now it's part of Visual Studio App Center. This lets you kind of test your app, like especially Android. There are just too many variations of it, so you can test your app on all of these form factors. They have little cameras on top of every phone, and they'll send you screenshots of how your app is running. So if you are writing a really professional app, and some of this is paid for, but this is really enterprise-grade services that you are uh, paying for. Uh, and there's obviously uh, analytics on how people are using your app, how much time they're spending. Uh, again, these are older screenshots, but they have corresponding things for uh, <clears throat> for um, um, NVS App Center. 
Okay, now let's talk uh, really quickly. I have 20 minutes left, okay? I want to spend like 15 minutes with uh, some demos. So network utilities, we should never be uh, in doubt as to what's happening in your network. Uh, and there are lots of tools. Uh, one of my favorite tools is Fiddler. If you're on Windows, you have likely used Fiddler to kind of get a network proxy and know what's going on uh, under your stack. Uh, you may not have heard this uh, latest news, but Fiddler, uh, we kind of took it. Uh, it's open source, but we kind of uh, made it Fiddler everywhere. So now you have uh, Fiddler running on Mac and Linux as well. Same network proxy, same visibility, and it, it's very good at kind of requesting your, uh, looking at your requests and responses, recording it, and then playing it back. So you can turn off your network. You can do uh, debugging on a plane if you wanted to. Uh, and then Postman is from Google, um, and this is great for testing out APIs, kind of mocking out your authentication uh, and then going with it. So great for testing out APIs for your mobile form factors. I use this quite a lot, uh, Reflector. Uh, again, there are other tools, uh, but this one is kind of wirelessly screen mirroring your thing, like especially if you're going to customers or if you're on a, a webinar like this where you want to show your phone screen, it wirelessly kind of shows your iOS or Android screen, which is very nice uh, for doing demos. So these are all kind of the tools and just a quick shout out for some of the mobile stuff that uh, we make. UI is particularly difficult for mobile apps and you should not have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so if you're doing .NET, uh, Telerik tools are there to help you kind of for web or mobile or desktop, uh, definitely for Xamarin, definitely for uh, other mobile tools. And then if you're doing web stuff and you want to do a BWA and you want to bring your framework, uh, then look at Kendi UI, uh, works for Angular, Vue, React or jQuery. So, there are some tools and there's some, there some help to kind of get you up to speed and ship your apps faster. Okay, so I am 40 minutes in. I'm gonna take a minute to see if I can answer some of your questions real quick and then I wanna show you some demos. Um, there are some news that um, Apple is clamping down on PWAs. Uh, do you know much about that? No, I don't know a lot of the details, but yes, Apple has been a little picky and they are, um, there was news that they were limiting the amount of storage that PWAs can have, but I, I don't know a lot. So maybe a little more uh, looking around is, is called for. Um, uh, Emil is asking, is there support for developing PWAs or React Native apps, specifically uh, dual screen devices? Um, honestly, I, I, I don't know. So dual screens are kind of new and I think it's up to you. So like if you load up a PWA, essentially you just have more real estate. So. Um, like if you're building it native, then the native SDKs will kind of help you out and give you like those two pages that you're looking for. But a PWA is essentially a website. So you will have to figure it out. And like by CSS queries, figure out exactly how much real estate you have and then kind of try to use that. Um, Madhumi, the strategy is asking, we have a PWA app running on Angular 1.4, but need to upgrade because Angular will stop supporting uh, best choice Angular 2 or React Native. Oh, okay. So this really depends, uh, right? So if you are building Angular apps, then Angular is probably the right thing to do. Uh, but if you are looking for like mobile apps as well, then look at uh, Native Script works really well with, uh, with Angular. Or if you want to switch gear, like to me, like it's like React, React and Angular is like, it's a matter of flavor. Like which one do you, do you like the more? Uh, so yeah, take a look and, and see what, uh, what works for you. So I'm going to stop here for just a second. I'm going to come back to your questions, but let's, uh, let's show you some stuff so we can actually look into some of the fun stuff that's happening. Uh, this one is the one that I uh, promised I'll show you. Let me bring this down a little bit. So if I uh, pull up, um, uh, again, I mean, don't care about the UI that I'm showing you. I just want to show you a quick uh, glimpse of what's possible um, with something like Blazor. If I go into some of the demos that we built, so this is our engineering team. <clears throat> Excuse me. If I look into this app here, so this is a Blazor PWA. Like I talked about, like Blazor is really hot and it's great for writing C sharp front and back. You can see that I'm getting the install warnings and I'm getting uh, Chrome to be asking me to install things, and I can uh, I can move move this. It's it's responsive, so works nicely on a mobile form factor, and I can install this and and I have a good solution. So um, PWAs with Blazor, it's you can absolutely do that. Um, just realize that you're writing the, C, uh, the UI in C Sharp instead of JavaScript. And if that's what you want to do, then Blazor is great. We'll let you have access to the same like storage and service workers that you're used to. But let's, uh, let's talk about uh, a few more things. Uh, let's uh, open a Visual Studio here real quick. And I have 15 minutes uh, sharp for some demos and that should be enough. And then I'll get back to some questions. Okay, let me uh, show you a couple of things if I can. So like I said, this is Visual Studio, works the same way on uh, Windows or Mac. 
So this, what you see is kind of a classic um, uh, Xamarin Forms solution, right? So you will essentially have uh, one uh, folder that's your uh, .NET standard library. And again, I'm speaking to the .NET developers in the house here. Uh, so this should feel uh, commonplace to you. And uh, for every platform uh, that we support, we have a platform specific build like iOS, Android, uh, or in this case, Mac. Uh, so essentially you want to have all of your code in those in the .NET standard library as you can, or if you can, and then do as minimal as possible because that's your code sharing strategy. So let me show you kind of a hello world app. Uh, this one here is a Xamarin Forms application. Uh, and let me bump up my fonts here a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to the cloud, fetching some data and showing it on a mobile device, which is kind of hello world for mobile apps, right? Because most mobile apps end up being like, uh, a list of things. And so this is the endpoint that I'm hitting. Uh, feel free to use that to like for demos. This is, I, I find this really nice. And, and there are lots of endpoints that you can hit into on, on the internet. This one here has like posts and comments and albums. So if I go to posts here, uh, it actually gives you things back in Latin and uh, you get like hundred or so posts. And that's kind of the structure of the JSON that they are uh, sending you back. So let's take a look at this app. And I'm gonna show you a couple of flavors of this app just to kind of uh, give you um, a glimpse of what's possible. So here, that's my RESTful endpoint, okay? This is app.xaml. This is how, kind of how XAML, uh, XAML forms apps start up. So you have main page that's pointing to the first page of your application. Then you have on start, you have on sleep, and you have on resume, which kind of are life cycle events for the, for the app. Um, case in point, um, uh, for iOS in particular, and I think Android as well, uh, you are not going to be notified if the OS, like if the user has been using your app for a long time and then it's just chewing memory, it's just sitting there, it's in the background, uh, eventually the OS will just going to kill the app, right? You do not get notified. So please, please save your state on, on sleep when your app goes to sleep. So here I have a, a starting page here. Uh, I have a plain uh, C-sharp object, which is essentially replicating what my JSON feed would be coming back from the cloud. I have a little manager object uh, or a class, which essentially uses HTTP client, makes the request out and get async to that RESTful endpoint, brings the data down and deserializes it back into this object, which is essentially an observable collection. This is something of a C-sharp generic, but it's just a little bit on steroids. So it knows how to do data binding, in particular two-way data binding. So it's nice. And then I can, I can filter the posts if I wanted to. So this is XAML. This is the front end of what we do in XAML forms. And I will show you this in a couple of different uh, versions of this. So this is XAML. And uh, again, you can complain that uh, I'm old and, and this gets a little verbose. And yes, I, I acknowledge all of that, but there are tools to kind of help you out. So here is a list view and essentially it has a template inside of it and it's just meant to show a label that shows you the title of the uh, of the thing that's coming back from the cloud. Here is my backend in which I'm just going to get all the posts and I'm binding it to the item source property. That's all, right? So let's go ahead and run this thing really quick. And given that I'm on a Mac, it already knows that I have Xcode installed. So it knows to go do the build and bring up an iPhone simulator. We'll give it a second. I'm not uh, cool enough to get the iPhone 12 yet. So this is still uh, the iPhone uh, 11 Pro Max that I'm running on. So we'll give it a second. And now you have kind of a hello world thing. So you have all of these posts come back from the cloud. They are in Latin and then I can, I can search, I can filter through them. So this is kind of hello world. This is how Xamarin Forms works, right? So now let's uh, do one quick uh, thing here. I'm gonna go in here and you can tell what I'm trying to do just by the name of the things. I'm gonna switch this up as a startup project, okay? And no change in code, right? And I'm gonna um, hit start debug again. And now you are gonna see a Mac desktop application, right? You can you can stretch this out, it's, it's in my dock right here. So this is a true Mac desktop application without any change of code. This is powered completely with Xamarin Forms and you have the same uh, uh, kind of list of posts coming back and the same filtering. So how am I doing this? This is again, not rocket science, the renderers are there. So in the Mac project, the only specific thing that we are doing is like, if there is no, no Mac uh, specific code here. So we are newing up an NS window and this is where uh, on the first launch when the app is first starting up, we are saying forms.init and load application app. So we are essentially loading up Xamarin Forms and letting that drive the UI 
instead of the normal uh, Cocoa pods and, and, and the storyboards that Mac desktop applications use. And I can show you the exact same demo. I don't know if I'm gonna have time, but I can show you the exact demo in on a WPF application. I can take the exact same code base from Xamarin Forms and run it on Mac, run it on WPF, run it on UWP. So I'm just trying to show you that uh, your code can have a lot of flexibility and you can share code between desktop and, uh, and mobile devices. But let's uh, let's switch gears a little bit. I, I want to show you a couple of different flavors of this. So let's look at uh, this solution here. So what I'm showing you here is what's called uh, uh, a mobile Blazor binding. If you are a web developer and if you're doing ASP.NET, if you're excited about Blazor, you can now actually use Blazor to write native uh, cross-platform apps. It is no magic. It's just literally sitting on top of Xamarin Forms and just letting you render the UI with Blazor Compiler model. So here you will notice that uh, this uh, solution here kind of looks like Xamarin Forms and it does uh, kind of bring in Xamarin Forms and Xamarin Essentials. But this one here, if you look at the code here, this is all Blazor syntax. Uh, I'm doing some imports here, and this is app.cs. This kind of starts out being a little different because this is kind of how an ASP.NET application starts out. So we are doing DI. We are bringing in and we are registering our components and our services. This one is pointing to a hello world. So this one here has the same exact code that we saw from Simon Forms, has that uh, list of posts, and it has the manager that can go and get the posts. Now, the only thing we're doing here is uh, in our code behind, we are saying, go get the posts. and keep it in a collection like, like this one here, posts to bind. And then I have uh, what's called uh, a component, a Blazor component here. This one is not Xamarin Forms. This one kind of looks a little bit like XAML because it, it is using some of the elements that Xamarin Forms offers to build the visual tree, but that's about it. Beyond that, this is all Blazor syntax and we are bringing in some code. Uh, there's no server side here. There's no web assembly here. This is pure Xamarin Forms play. And uh, we, we have a property here that I can set. So in my hello world.razor, I can uh, have a stack layout and I'm repeating over every component or every post that I got. And for every post, I'm rendering this component. So it's kind of like React. So we are repeating 100 times to render 100 components. So when I run this thing, um, it'll take a second. You're going to see the same exact app uh, that we saw from Xamarin Forms, except it's done very differently, like in Blazor. So if you want uh, Blazor, if you like that syntax, uh, is it still building? Oh, it's still building. Okay, so if you like the Blazor component model, the Razor syntax, then this, this is for you. So same exact app, right? But just done differently, not in Xamarin Forms, done with web technologies, if that's what you uh, are looking for. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, I got nine minutes left. Okay, we're doing okay. All right, so let's uh, let's close this thing down one more time and let's talk about uh, one other solution. Uh, let's do a comment. So if you look at um, uh, .NET MAUI, which we talked about, this is kind of the iteration. This is the next evolution of, uh, of Xamarin Forms. Then uh, start here. Uh, this, this is a Microsoft post. Do a search and you'll see what, uh, what this entails. Essentially, if you are a Xamarin Forms developer today, you'll be able to do the same things tomorrow. But it, it's not just MVVM. It's not just C Sharp and XAML. We are opening it up to be able to do Blazor. And we're opening it up to do MVU, which is uh, the other design pattern that we want to support. And uh, this is coming from a framework called Comet right now. This is experimental. Um, but you will see in this solution here, I have no references to Xamarin Forms, but it is using the renderers under the covers to give you some of the benefits of using Xamarin Forms. Uh, but it, it's not using Xamarin Forms per se, but it's using the renderers. And here you're defining your UI in a completely different way. There is no XAML, there is no HTML. This is kind of decorative C sharp kind of looks like Flutter in a way. Uh, so here's my view and uh, the state is essentially the model. That's my uh, model that's controlling the state of the application. This one here is just a count. And the view is essentially one gigantic function and it renders that over and over again. And it's careful to kind of do a diff and not render it things that are not changed. So here I have a, um, a V stack is essentially a vertical stack. You can have a horizontal stack. This is all decorative C sharp. So here's a text and the idea is nobody touches the uh, read only state except you get to update the value of it. And then everybody else who's listening in uh, gets to reap the benefits. So if I run this really quick and th this actually works on Visual Studio code as well. So you don't have to do uh, the full Visual Studio. Uh, we'll wait for this to come up in just a second. And uh, so this is just again, hello world. So you can see that I can, I can 
keep uh, clicking on that, it updates this. Essentially, the button is doing a delegate function, updates the value of the state, and then the text just picks up because it's, it's tied to it, right? So this is coming. This is coming next year uh, for, for Xamarin Forms and opening it up to other c -sharp developers from other backgrounds as well. So let me switch gears. I got uh, probably four more minutes to do uh, the web stuff, right? So. Uh, not much time in an hour. So let me show you a little bit. So I talked about native script. Uh, this is something that's uh, real nice. Oh, and uh, React Native, I, I don't think I'm going to have time, but start here. Uh, it, it is very simple. Uh, like you can see, like if you go into learning the basics, like you can see how simple things are. This is JSX. You are uh, embedding a little bit of uh, HTML inside of your JavaScript, and uh, the JSX knows how to render that. Uh, natively for iOS or Android. So take a look at that. Uh, the tools of the trade are very, very simple. You can do uh, Expo, which lets you kind of do it within a shell. So you don't have to actually have iOS or Android, but for serious development, you nearly need to get to like React Native uh, CLI. Uh, but let me show you one other flavor of the CLI uh, or uh, kind of similar CLI. This is native script. The easiest way to kind of play around with this is play.nativescript.org. So it's just all in browser development. You see up front, it's, it's kind of very eager to give you a QR code. What it's doing is it's asking you to pull up a sample app uh, from that you can get from the store. And then you scan the QR code, then it knows how to deploy the app uh, directly to your phone. Uh, it is running inside of a shell. So one of the things you'll notice is if I can bump up the fonts here, one of the things you'll notice that uh, I can start in a couple of different ways. I can do Angular, I can do JavaScript or TypeScript, or I can do Vue. So if I did uh, JavaScript, then you get a project and it's keeping on giving me the QR code. So you have app-wide CSS, you have app-wide JavaScript. Uh, there is nothing in here. And then each component gets a JavaScript, gets an XML. The XML kind of looks like uh, XAML in a way. It's got the stack layout, it's got the labels and uh, you, you get a view model if you're doing stuff with observables. Uh, so that's it. And then you have all of these components here um, that, uh, let me see if I can minimize things a little bit, got too big on me. So you got all of these uh, components here that can uh, lets you like kind of drag and drop. And once you're done building, and let's say you want to switch this up, uh, let's just go to uh, let's say Angular. Then you're going to see uh, a whole bunch of things changing. Now you have Angular. Uh, now you have TypeScript up front, and you have uh, app-wide components, and you have home modules, uh, which can you can style with CSS. You can have home HTML which again, like this piece of UI is what's gonna be different between your web app and your desktop app or your mobile app and the rest can be all to be shared. And now you're having like uh, Angular components that you're bringing in just like any other Angular component that you're writing. And when you're done doing all of this, what you can do is pull up the QR code again, scan your app and then it's uh, deployed to your device right away. Uh, and then once you're done kind of looking around and you feel comfortable, you hit download, then it downloads the app. Uh, to your local drive and, and you start. Because a lot of it is powered by um, uh, a CLI in the back end. So let me show you this real quick. Uh, I'm gonna pull up my, um, my terminal on here. I know I have four minutes left, but that should be enough. So I wanna show you uh, really quick what this entails. So if I do uh, a native script uh, uh, command here, it, it'll show you all the things that uh, it can do, like create and, and build, how you add platform specific projects and how you do a run, how you do a deploy. It's all there in CLI. So if I go over to a project, uh, so yeah, I, can, I have done like uh, NS create new project. So uh, let me go over to one and I think I have a project that's called native script, hello world, right? I'm gonna go in there and I can do run on iOS. So what that's gonna do is uh, fire up Xcode, go to the build and come back um, uh, so I can run my iOS application. And it's still searching and we'll give it a second. So, and it has templates. So you can do uh, create new project with Angular, create new project with React or Vue or like straight up JavaScript or TypeScript if you wanted to. So it is trying to find my iOS devices and we'll give it a second. And it has what's called a hot module replacement. So HMR uh, from Webpack. So again, it knows exactly what module you're, you're uh, building for. And we'll give it one more second and then we'll switch over to some of your Q and A. It is thinking almost. I got the simulator ready and waiting if you want. Oh, it, it did come up, sorry, I, I wasn't looking at it. So you have the simulator here. 
Uh, this one's a simple app. I can I can tap and it comes down. Uh, one of the things that's nice is if I if I stop this, I actually have uh, code in my path, so I can do code dot, and you see uh, Visual Studio Code pull up the same app. And uh, this one here uh, is just uh, everything is inside of app. That's my main page XML. So that's the stack layout. That's the button. And you can enable uh, live preview here. So you can write some code here, just save the file. And then your, uh, then your simulator just updates itself uh, really, really quickly. So very quick uh, dev cycles. And you get the same experience with Flutter. You get the same experience with React Native. If you want to do CLI and if you want to do web technologies, that's all here for you. Okay? So uh, cho choose your poison, essentially. Uh, and uh, really, the, the tools of, the, of our trade have really come a long way. So I'm going to uh, go back to my slides here. This is where we started, right? And the goal is not to kind of make this more confusing for us. The goal is to pick the right framework because uh, most times when you're building for mobile, it's not just that one thing you are doing, you are likely building desktop applications or other web applications, right? So look into how you can share your code the best between the other technology stacks that you invested with. And again, the tools of our trade have come a long way. Each of these things will give you native API access all through and being able to bundle your apps. So uh, my last parting thoughts here, the world, again, it's a different place that we are all living through, uh, but we have a lot of ammunition as software developers to go build amazing mobile apps. So uh, let's let's do it on our preferred platform. And I'm gonna uh, stop on this slide here with, uh, with my social handle again. So please feel free to reach out so we can keep chatting. And now I'm at time. So let me quickly go into some of your questions. Uh, let's see, I stopped with uh, the PWA question. Uh, Daniel Kuhlman is asking, can you share a link uh, where Apache said Cordova does not? Uh, um, I'll try to find it, Daniel, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw Apache say that they are putting it in maintenance mode. I, I will try to find it, but um, and do some Google search. I'm sure you, uh, you can uh, get to it quicker than I can. Um, but again, I mean, just being in maintenance mode, like for, for all we know, like .NET Framework is in maintenance mode, doesn't mean it's dying, right? So it's, it's fine. If you want to go build hybrid apps with Cordova, absolutely. Um, but you have to look at your use case and uh, what you're building. Uh, does native script, Ivan is asking, does native script generate executables that you can distribute? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, uh, it creates a .app or a .apk package that you can distribute to the stores. And we can actually automate some of the workflow as does uh, Xamarin. Um, you know, Russ is saying, well done covering topics. It's a lot of different things we covered. And um, oh, Russ Freeman is asking, what's your personal recommendation one to five? Uh, okay, I come from a .NET background. So I lean towards things like Xamarin Forms, things like uh, .NET MAUI, but that's just me. If you are using web technologies today, stick to that because like you have amazing tools. Uh, if you want to use uh, the web as a distribution medium, go build PWAs. If you want to write for uh, the app stores, then go pick up React Native or Native Script uh, and, and just go write native apps that are cross platform. Again, the, I mean, Visual Studio Code just works everywhere. The tools are great. Uh, so uh, there, there is nothing stopping us. So again, like to me, it's like a fork in the road. Do you want to do .NET or do you want to do JavaScript? And, and you go accordingly to uh, what else do you have going on? Okay, I think that's all the Q&A that I can see. I see uh, some folks uh, in the chat room as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, shall we do both PWA and APK for better mobile performance from Mathumila again? Um, it, it depends, uh, really. I mean, if you want to have a thin shell uh, that you want to throw up as a PWA and then for a more richer experience that's more performant, you want to invite people to use your, uh, your native mobile app, then yes, absolutely. So PWAs have a specific use case, so um, you can you can cater to those lightweight uh, uh, use cases. And then for everything else that's more involved or you need native APIs, then you come and build uh, native apps. Right, so I mean, the, the classic thing with, um, well, I think the rest of the chat is just uh, more questions that we have already answered. So the classic thing with software engineering, uh, software development, as we say, is it depends. It really depends on what you're trying to do and what type of code base you wanna maintain going forward. But the good news is the tools of our trade are great, no matter what you pick and you should be set up for success. So I'm three minutes over. I'm gonna stop here and uh, Kate uh, or Dom from Prosa, do you folks wanna come on? Come back on, there you go. Yes, hello. Yeah. Sam, thank you so much for that, for sharing all of that with us. There's certainly a lot for us to take in. Yeah. 
Um, and just as a reminder to everybody, we will be sending you an email with a link to the recording, all of Sam's uh, presentation slides and the code as well that he shared with us. So watch out for that. It should arrive in a day or two. So I guess I'll draw the webinar to a close now, just to say thank you again, Sam, for your time today. And thank you to everyone for joining us from all around the world. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. So Absolutely. stay safe. Thanks for having Have me. Have a great day. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.